Welcome to Total Picture Media and another edition of WTF 2020, an influencer's guide to navigating the shit show. My name is Peter Clayton. Thank you for tuning in. So what's your opinion of 2020 so far? Here's mine. Between COVID-19, climate change, Black Lives Matter, our political shit show, a government is in complete disarray with no leadership, no conscience, no integrity, no honesty. We're adrift in a sea of daily. What happened now? Is this every man, woman, and child for themselves? It sure feels like it. The fucking Titanic is sinking and we're all on it. Uh, the group of influencers, thought leaders, subject matter experts, innovators, and visionaries I've invited to participate in this series can give us all uh, some inspiration, maybe a renewed sense of purpose, or at least some hope that eventually we'll find our way out of this nightmare. Today, I'm delighted to welcome back to Total Picture Media my good friend, William Tincup. William is the president and editor at large of Recruiting Daily, the intersection of HR and technology. He's a writer, speaker, advisor, consultant, investor, storyteller, teacher. He's written over 250 HR articles, spoken at over 350 uh, recruiting conferences, and he's conducted over 1,300 HR podcasts and webinars. He holds degrees from three universities, including an MBA from Case Western University, and William serves on numerous boards and has SHRM SCP certification and SPHR from the HR Certification Institute. We were re supposed to record this, this video last week, but hey, uh, uh, you know, it is 2020 and a goddamn tree fell on his house. So, <laughs> William... Thanks for uh, thanks for showing up, man. How you doing, uh, brother? I am <laughs> doing well. And the, and it, the tree it looked worse than it was, uh, which I think is kind of a a, a a segue into the conversation we're going to have. It looked worse. It, it did wreck the fence, and insurance took care of that. But the the roofer came out, and actually, it was more of a simple fix than I thought it was. But it looked epic, and it sounded epic for sure, um, which I. I think is kind of a, is the way I think of 2020. I had such high hopes for 2020. I went in 2019 or roll around, even 2018 when I was, I kind of looked out at 2020 and I said, man, we've been talking about 2020 for so long. It's going to be such a wonderful, <laughs> a wonderful year. And um, I think it's, it's almost like you've seen those TV shows where they're down in the ratings and like every plot twist comes out like it's almost like the producers and the writers are like let's just throw everything at the show and see if the audience responds that's what 2020 feels like it seems like it feels like season five of a, of a tv show that's struggling and the producers and the director and the writers have just said you know what let's write off the main character Let's uh, let's introduce let's let's bring back a dead character. Let's you know let's do all kinds of stuff. Let's have a sister marry an uncle. You know just all kinds of whatever you can think of, just to see if the audience will go. Hmm. Okay, I'm back now. No, 2020 has thrown everything at us, and it's just October. I mean, it's just the beginning of October, so we can't even say it's done yet. Uh, there's still three months left. Yeah, I've already bought my 2020, 2021 <laughs> planner because I, I just, I can't wait for this goddamn year to be over with. It's, it, it is, I, I'll tell you what, it's, uh, for those that, that, uh, that have studied religion or, 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 or religious in some ways, the, the book of Job, it reminds me, this r reminds me of the book of Job because Job, Job is one of those characters where God throws <laughs> literally everything at Job just to test whether or not, you know, he'll still have faith. Right. And, uh, I think that's, it's, you know, kind of feels like that the <laughs> murder hornets. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, you could have named that any type of hornet you wanted to. It's, it's a, you know, that could have been a bit where you, you could have named it after a friend. No, they named these things murder hornets, uh, again. Uh, and I, I think that, you look around, you named a lot of things uh, in the intro and in the monologue, climate change. I mean, just 
you know, today they, they put California on a 36 hour, you know, watch for a, a major earthquake. And it's like, like this state needs an earthquake after all the fires that it's gone through and ever all the chaos, like it needs an, like, like anyone needs an earthquake, but, but like it needs an earthquake, but that's, that's 2020. Um, but I'll tell you after, after all is said and done, we, uh, we're a resilient people. Um, and I think that's one of the things when you study the history of the world, you know, these things happen, bad years, have bad presidents happen. Bad years happen. Um, this has happened to every dynasty and every every empire uh, throughout the, throughout time. It's it's what 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 what's what I find fascinating is what are we going to be on the other side of this? What are we going to decide that we want to be? It's it's but it's in our hands. It's it really is in our hands to decide. Do do we do what do we want to be? Do we want to be a republic? Uh, do we want to be? You know, we've got a lot of options in front of us. There's a lot of both proven models and failed models. So, but it's, it is in, in front of us and I, I have more hope. And I guess that's one of the things that, that, that as we explore, uh, you know, during our time together, I, it's easy to get depressed. I mean, it, it really is because yeah. of just all the things, every, everywhere you turn, it's bad news. It, it's overwhelming. It's yeah. overwhelming. And it's, and it's, I think it's easy to be overwhelmed and it's natural. So like when I talk to folks, I'm like, Hey, whatever you're feeling, like you're feeling like I, I there's no judgment. You know, I, we're out of the judgment business Two twenty twenty 2020 has taught us that like they, like if you were judgmental before 2020, I think you put a hit, you hit a hard pause on that. Um, because people grieve, um, and go through trauma in different ways. And, and we've all been, we are going through a very traumatic e- event and uh, we don't know when that traumatic event's going to end. Um, and so I, I'm, I be- I've become super flexible with people, you know, like normally I'd uh, like something simple, like calls, I would have like a 10 minute rule. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like I'd set up a call for somebody and I'd wait for 10 minutes. And if they weren't there by 10 minutes, I'd be like, all right, okay, I'll send them an email nowadays i'll just stay on the line yeah <laughs> you know what yeah, I, mean? like, I, I you know i i think you've got a really good point i mean we all need to just be a little bit more empathetic yeah. and understanding that uh people are just you know uh some sir told me the other day you know machine learning forget about it because everything the machines have learned is out the window right i yeah. and and it's true <laughs> yeah well the data it's sitting on top of is not going to be data that hopefully is uh, indicative of the future so yeah, let's so, hope. <laughs> so let's hope right. uh, unless you're predicting catastrophes then yeah. you've got a wonderful data model that, that can help you navigate uh that but i, I think you know trauma um and and dealing with you know traumatic events i think it's one of those things that as human beings, we consume them differently. And then from day to day, we consume them differently. So you can get bad news on a Tuesday and consume it and go, okay, you know what? I still got a day's worth of work to do. And you can get the same news on Thursday and it can cripple you. I mean, you can, I mean, I've, I mean, I, I myself have noticed that, you know, I'll get to a point with, with what's going on and I'm just going to go take a nap. And I'm just going to go shut my brain off and lay down and try to think of something else just to recover. Yeah. And I think, you know, last year or years before I would have thought, no, you got a lot of work. You keep working. You just kind of right. work through the pain. It's like, no, you, you deal with the trauma. However you feel like you need to. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I've been meditating every morning and I find that Smart. really helpful. Smart. Know? Oh, well, I think it's, I think that's smart for, for now. Um, but like I was teaching my, my son's yoga the other day and both of them were looking at it at 14 and 10. So they were like, why, <laughs> why are we doing yoga? I said, trust me on this one. Yeah. If you learn yoga at your age and you stick with it through your life, um, you'll just, A, your flexibility and all this, all this positive stuff, but just the mindfulness, like where you go when you meditate. Um, right. And, and having that, that ability to kind of shut things out 
and just think, you know, positive thoughts. Think, think about the positivity because there are every once in a while you'll hear a positive story. Like, like this morning I was driving back and I dropped uh, Van Ollis off at school and I was driving back. And of course the news was on uh, American airlines is laying off 20,000 people. Cause that's, you know, <laughs> of course yeah. they are. And of then, course. and then the other side of the story was Southwest airlines. They're not laying off. They're not, they're not going to furlough, furlough people. They're going to try other kinds of things. They're going to shut down flights. They're going to kind of re, you know, redo people and kind of, reposition them and do different things and give early retirements like they're going to try everything in their in their being to not furlough yeah well you talk about radically different cultures <laughs> right <laughs> radically is yeah. uh is, is an understatement and i am you know they're both headquartered here in dallas so of course i get to see a lot of both of them but it's just like there is good news but it's so hard to find with all the bad news. Yeah. It's like you really have to, different from previous years, different from, and even during the Great Recession, um, and even during 9-11 or the, the dot-com, there were still some positive things. Yeah. This year, it just seems like wave after wave, wave. after wave yeah. of just crap. Yeah. I, I was really praying that RGB was going to make it to the end of the year. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's there's one example of here we go again. Well, I think it's with with that one in particular. Um, I mean, I you know she did she did uh, as best as she could, right? Oh uh, my god! Uh, and and far more than than I than I could do. Um, but I I think it's also one of those things. That if if they push, if if the Republicans decide to push, I mean, remember her her. I mean, she's she's an all star, right? First ballot all American, all American. She's 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 a Hall of Famer, and her confirmation took fifty days. Right. That was the shortest confirmation <laughs> in yeah. the last in the last I think twenty confirmations or whatever whatever it was when I read it. I'm like, and that was fifty days, and she had been arguing in front of the Supreme Court for thirty years. <laughs> so so it's not like she was an unknown, you know. 50 days. It still took them 50 days to get that deal done. And she was a first ballot Hall of Famer. Yeah. So I, I think if they push, I understand why they want to push. Like, I get it. I mean, I, I have a lot of conservative friends, and I, I understand why they want to push. I just think that uh, if they try to push, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to backfire on them. Yeah, I hope you're right. Yeah. Uh, so, so tell us about the pivot recruiting daily has made because of COVID-19. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So one of the things that we did as a business, we got, we got lucky on a couple fronts. So last year at the end of the year, we decided not to cash out, which normally, you know, but small businesses, you know, you basically try to zero out and not carry a lot of balance forward. You get taxed on it. Um, um, we we still paid more taxes than Trump, but yeah, that's a different issue. Um, Everyone paid more taxes than yes, Trump. But, <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. I, I mean that that is kind of a uh, who didn't pay. Yeah, you look around. Exactly. I, I think there's probably billionaires that are really pissed. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, what's going? Where who are my tax attorneys? Call, get Deloitte on the phone. I want to find out why we paid more taxes. Yeah, so. Um, one of the things I think that we got a stroke of good luck and it really, it really a pivot is both the recognition of that you need to do something different, but also having some good luck. And uh, so one of it is we brought the balance for, for forward. Second thing is Noel was all over um, the, uh, the, the funds that were coming out of the government from day one, he had been already researching, talking to a banker, talking to an accountant. So, we were very early in that process um, and, and, got, and that's all to his diligence. I, I give him all the credit in the world because he spent hours on hours on the phone uh, talking with people and trying to figure out like what we were going to do when the time was right. So then, then February hits and we decide not to sell. So one of the things that we did is we said, you know what? The last thing vendors need uh, or practitioners need from us right now is sales messages. 
that's just you know that's the last thing that they need because you know you take a company that that you really like you know all the same folks i do they're going through 45 50 percent staff reductions they don't need a sales email they don't need a sales call uh even if they wanted to do something with you they don't have the money to it's frozen or if they do spend money with you it'll look bad the optics will look bad because they just laid off a bunch of people. So we threw ourselves into the events that we had been having for the last four years, which were kind of a, a city tour event where you drop in and do training and um, sourcing training and recruiting training, hiring manager training, stuff like that. And, uh, and we were really getting really good at it. We'd, we'd, we'd really gotten to where we could, we could pack a room, 200, 250 people, and practitioners paying for that and you know us paying you know speakers and all that stuff and uh and then obviously COVID hit we we very early on got on virtual events and basically said well we're going to still train in fact probably now it's needed more than it was even in december so we're going to train but we're not going to charge the practitioners and we'll figure out creative ways to work with vendors and uh and and from february to you know last month We've had a haven't had an event every month, trained, uh, you know, I think it's now over 20 something thousand recruiters uh, on sourcing. And I think it's I think I've, you know, the notes that I've gotten from recruiters and sourcers is that it's been a light, you know, it's been a nice thing to have a, a, a distraction, uh, right. a way to learn something, a way to get a kind of a new skill. Um, and, and so I, I like that. I like that we've done something positive for the community. Um, and, and, you know, it's for me personally, because I'm not traveling every week, it's gotten me to produce more content, which mm -hmm. I love. Like you, if I had my druthers, uh, I would just sit around and create content all day. Um, you know, and, and like, it's like art. I would just love to be sitting around creating content you know, for 12 hours a day, that would, that would be the perfect job. Uh, but you know, the last three or four years I've been on a plane, you know, pretty much every week and it's hard to produce content as you exactly. well know. It's, exactly. it's hard. It's hard to come out with those outputs when you're on a plane, when you're, you know, going from conference to conference mm -hmm. or whatever. So that's been my personal pivot is that I've enjoyed. It's got me back to enjoying content and enjoying create the creative process and uh, and and i think our business has done well because of that the content but also because we're still in a process of not selling really like mm -hmm. <laughs> you know normally go back to 1918 you know 17 we would have been hardcore selling people you know either practitioners on the training or are on on vendor selection or consulting and or our vendors, we would have been selling them all kinds of different things. We just basically hit, took our foot off the gas pedal and said, you know what? It's a small business. We don't have to make a lot of money and it's not a good time to sell. Yeah. So, Yeah, I agree with you. And, and I've basically taken the same position as well. Um, obviously my costs are way down because I'm not on airplanes. I'm not traveling to conferences and, uh, you know, I do want to try to pay it forward a little bit at this 100%. point in time and because so many people are in such dire straits and I'm very fortunate that I'm not, you know, that I've got a roof over my head and, I, you know, I pay my bills and um, I'm able to maintain. And I think it's important that um, for us that have that ability to try and just kind of level it out for the rest of this year and, and see what comes along in 2021. And, you know, if we can start the sales cycle again, then, you know, you know what our phones will ring. That's, that's, uh, yeah. that's what you and I both know because we've been through many of these is that when vendors, they know we're here, they know, they know what you do. They know yeah. what I do. And, and they know that when they have money and when they can, they'll reach out. I'm I'm not worried about that one bit. Um, I, I think it's you know you you recenter your life when these events happen. You start to prioritize what really is important. Right. And uh, I'll tell you, 
Peter, and, and you, you might feel differently, but I'm, I'm forever changed on business travel. And now I look at it with my kids being at the ages that they are, I look at it and I say to myself, okay, traveling in the future, whenever COVID ends, traveling in the future for William looks like this. There's either a big fucking check or there's a, a destination that I really want to go to. Right. So somebody's having a conference in Vienna. I'm probably yeah. going to that bit. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I'm probably going Paris, to Paris, London, yeah. Amsterdam. Yeah. I'll be okay. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody Vegas. Dubai. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it, that's the thing. Okay. So uh, Midland, Texas calls and says, hey, we want you to come out and do this bit. If it's not one of those two things, it's a Zoom call. Yeah. That's what we've proven to ourselves over the last couple of months is like we can do a lot of these things that we thought that we had to be in the room for. Right. We don't have to be in a room. That's we right. can do those things remotely because we've proven that we can do those things remotely. And so now, I, I mean, I've, I've been executive platinum on American for as long as I can remember. Yeah, I'm okay with losing status. I'm okay with not having that card. I'm okay with, you know, maybe only taking four or five trips a year. Like that's, I'm, yeah. intellectually and emotionally, I've crossed over to a place of huge fucking check destination that I want to go to. Other than that, it's a Zoom call. The reason I'm able to do this series and have shifted mainly to video is because people have the capability now to do this. That's right. You know, they have decent cameras, they have decent equipment, um, and everyone uh, working at home now has realized that, okay, I've got to up the game here on my video capabilities, my audio, um, because I have to look good, look professional, and be professional and not have to worry about, you know, my uh, computer blowing up or something <laughs> or, you know, having every two seconds to be buffering on video <laughs> because I've got some shit connection. You know? well, it's funny that you mentioned that. I, I moved. I went to the, the Logitech uh, Brio cam, I don't know, probably a month ago, and I love it. Like I'd had my other Logitech cam for forever and I loved it as well. But I, I finally, I, I just, I said, you know what? I need to, I need to up my game here. And it's exactly for the reasons that you mentioned. Yeah. It's I'm on more video calls and I'm on more uh, webinars and things like that, that, that really, uh, they need to see me in high def. They need to see again, you know, the, the, the quality of sound needs to be there. And uh, I redid my office. Yeah, I'll show you. I like it. So, like, like it, everything in here I created. So That's so cool. So it's like a museum of William, right? So, but I love that because a, it's it's helped me be more creative, um, and b, I've got stories. Like I can actually point to something and go, okay, let me tell you a little bit about this painting, you know, or let me tell you a little bit about this photo, and so I, I like that. I like the ability yeah. of being able to do that. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, thinking about backgrounds, again, to your point, right. it's like, you know, would I have thought about that as much in 2019? Uh, probably not. Yeah. Lighting, you know, I probably wouldn't have thought. Now, you're, you've been in video for a long time. Yeah. So you, you've always been ahead of the game. Uh, I, think, I think most of uh, the people that you interact with are catching up. Uh, you know, they're, they're just finally getting to aware. They're aware of things that you were aware of, you know, 15 years ago. And, and I'm really happy that people are catching up because I love doing video. And now, yes. uh, and now it doesn't look like surveillance <laughs> camera, you know, it actually looks like video. <laughs> is, is that a mugshot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm really interested in, you know, in the, in the transition you guys have made to doing virtual events, yep. you know, and workshops, what technology are you using? And I'm assuming that you, you've been doing this for a while now. So you've learned some things and changed up some things. Um, what recommendations can you share with us about, you know, how to do this effectively? So all video conferencing software, uh, any event software sucks. Yes. So let's just start there. Yes. Um, now, 
uh, some sucks more than others uh, or, 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 or in different ways. We first started off with um, GoToWebinar, but it was the GoToWebinar version where you could call in. And uh, so you, so, so the first event, horrible uh, audio quality, like almost unre- I mean, people could hear it, but the recordings were almost un- unrecognizable. Um, then we went to go to webinars webcast version, which has a limit of a thousand people. It, but it's stable because it takes away the call in. So you can't call into it. So there's not all the burst of, you know, all that stuff. And, uh, it's just a webcast since we did that. I think in March, everything's, it's been totally stable and we've had, you know, 35, 3,800, uh, 3,800 registrations. But again, when people register just like for a webinar, um, they don't all go. A lot of them are signing up just to get the recording so they can go watch it on their own right. uh, later on. And we've got close to the 1,000 a couple different times. And, of course, you know, there's a little panic button there. But, uh, but, but we've never hit a 1,000 simultaneous users or over a 1,000. So we haven't. We haven't, have, we haven't broken it yet. I've used every, every uh, like Zoom, I've used that actually pretty good, uh, pretty stable. I've used Hopin just most recently uh, this week. And uh, it, I've used it five times and two times there were, there were problems. One of them, it was during that time, it was for TalentNet and the internet broke. It was one mm-hmm. of those Fridays where the, you right. know, the internet little, broke. Yeah, and, um, and so it wasn't Hoppin's fault. So that's that one. This last one was this week for the recruiting automation conference is one of their limitations is you could only have five people on a stage, which no one knew in advance. And uh, <laughs> so, so the organizer, Surprise! I'm a moderator and there's four panelists. It's like, okay, somebody can't be on the, on the stage and uh, and and the audio for two of the panelists was was really bad, um, but I would tell you that without throwing hopping under the bus, I think that's true of all these technologies. Yeah, I think that you know you catch them on the wrong day. I, you and I use Zoom. I I use Zoom uh, three weeks ago on a Monday, and I think it was the Monday when a lot of people started to go back to school uh-huh. when school started to open up, and it was broken. Like yeah. all day long. And I had a, a slate full of calls and I canceled every one of them. I'm like, listen, Zoom's not working. So let's just move over to my cell or your cell, whatever, right. and, and go that route. Um, so I, I think that for us, the go to webinar webcast version mm-hmm. that has a thousand, it limits a thousand, but it takes away the phone line. That's been super stable. And you can go back and look at the videos from the events and they're like, they're crisp, uh, and and audio quality is good, uh, video quality is good, and it's and and again, it, it, no breaks, none of that, none of that, none of that stuff that happens. I mean, you still have people <laughs> at user error, right, where somebody doesn't know how to unmute themselves. Like right. it's, it's a yeah. green button in the corner. I get you got to hit the fucking button. <laughs> <laughs> you know, outside of user errors it's been pretty stable. I mean, not pretty, it's, it's been super stable for us. I find this all fascinating because we have really good friends in the conference business, right? You know, people like Mark at yep. Unleash and, you know, David at ERE, you know, we can just go on and on. And, and I keep thinking, you know, what, what the hell is going to happen to these events? Because, this technology is only going to get better. Everyone right. is going to get familiar with it. They're going to know how to get themselves off of mute. And <laughs> our company's going to go, well, are we going to really spend 20 grand to do a booth and send a bunch of people to Vegas for three days and maybe end up with a little bit of business? Or can we do this thing virtually? And you know, one thing you brought up um, offline last week when we were talking that I think is absolutely uh, spot on is I think more companies are going to start doing user conferences and 
very specific small events for their customers and prospects where they control the invitation list, they control the event, they control everything. And it may be only, you know, 40 or 50 people, but it's the right 40 or 50 people. That's right. Did you ever see the movie Below? Yes. It's the lesson of the movie Below. When it's you go right to the source, right? So as soon as you can go right to the source, you go right to the source. So conferences in the traditional sense have been an, uh, an, an, kind of that in-between. It's the, it's the person you got to know to then f- go and find the other people that you need to meet. Well, now, you don't, you don't need conferences. Um, and I, I think that, you know, you look at that, the economic model of charging practitioners to see content, that's done. That's out. You know, that, that, that unless 25,000 people at a SHRM event. No, when is that, that going to happen? That's gone. And, and a lot of that, the drivers for that for them are they can get it elsewhere. So that's number one. Two, the training budget is shot. The travel budget is shot. And, uh, oh, by the way, they don't, they, they can get it elsewhere. But, but, you know, outside of the boondoggle that people, when, when people want to go to those events, oh, it's in New Orleans. I've always wanted to visit New Orleans. Well, you know what? You can visit New Orleans. You don't have to use a conference to visit New Orleans. Yeah, that's right. There's planes, yeah. and cars, trains, <laughs> I guess. You don't really have to do that. Right. Um, and you'll probably have a better time. It turns out. And you won't be wearing a badge on, on bourbon on yeah. the street. So I think the, uh, the other part of that is what you just uh, uh, alluded to, which is the vendor side, the economics for them, paying for travel and hotels and for the ability to get in front of an audience in a, in a vendor hall, what a lot of people will refer to as a vendor ghetto, um, and hope that pe- the right people come by, stop, spend time with you. And uh, I think all of that is shot. I think it's shot forever. I don't think the conference business as we knew it in 19, I don't think it'll ever come back that way. I think, I think people are gonna have to do different things because the elements of a conference is you have content for practitioners. So you essentially have bait for the fish. Right. And then you bring the people that want to attract the fish. Okay. And they're the ones paying the freight. They're the ones that, that, that are really paying the freight for everything is the vendors. And if they can do it again, the lesson of blow, if they can do it directly, why would they ever, why would they ever go through uh, uh, an intermediary? Again, um, and and they'll go, and again, they don't have to share. So if they if they do it, like Isims is having their thing, I think in November, they're gonna they got Trevor Trevor Noah speaking at it. Like like it's not like you have to suffer right. and have terrible content. Like no, I want to see Trevor Noah. Yeah, me too. Uh, so I mean, you know, like I want to do that bit. Um, so I so it's not like the content. It's not like you're gonna get lesser content. No. No, they, they can book good people too, and and they will. And I think that's one of the things is, okay, so now if as a practitioner, I don't have to pay, I don't have to go, and I don't have to be sold to. And from a vendor's perspective, I don't have to share. I don't have to be across the booth. If I'm ADP, I don't have to be across you know, the, the way from Ceridian. I don't have right. to share that. Right. Like I can go and get my own and they can go get their own and we can, you know, do, do that. So I think there's going to be a, a deluge of content and in any events, I think it's going to get to a point where there's virtual events and virtual conferences three and four times a week. And which sounds like a lot, but I, I think again, there's, there's an appetite there. If you put good content in front of people, they'll, they'll, they'll attend it virtually. Right. Um, and so I'm, I'm not and worried. Especially, about you know, especially if you record it and have it at, on demand. Good point. Then, you know, like you're doing with your webinars. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think, I, yeah, absolutely. I think that, that again, that, that then gives them the, the, they can then choose when to consume that. Right. It's like an on demand when we, when we first kind of moved to, you know, setting your VCR and all that type of stuff. It's like, I'll watch that TV show when I want to watch that TV show. I think it's forever changed. 
uh, Peter. I think, again, I think that now conferences can get creative and do things that maybe are a bit more human, which is kind of an interesting, I think you and I talked about this, where they can say, okay, now it's not just about content. We're going to have, you know, more speed dating and speed learning. So now what we're going to do is you're going to come into a room and you're going to go through and meet a hundred people and you're going to spend five minutes with each person. They're going to tell you about them. You're going to tell them about them. You're going to meet each other and you're going to have a human connection. And you can't get that online. Right. You can't, you can't get that bit through Zoom. Um, or it's harder to do that through Zoom or, or through another light. Like, so we could see them get real creative. But like if we looked at HR Tech and Unleash last year at the end of the year, those won't be the same events. No. Ever, ever again. As I mentioned in my open, you serve on a number of boards of companies in the HR tech space. Do you right. believe there will be more tech consolidation next year? Yeah, I think there's consolidation. Uh, first of all, it's it's like trees in the forest. Consolidation is always happening, and and there's there's good times for it, bad times for it, right? So, when the market is high, it's consol it's consolidating because people are trying to buy customers and revenue. Um, when the market is low, there's consolidation because people want deals. They want to they want to find something that's distressed and that's awesome, and then buy it at a at a discount. So there's always consolidation. I think what's interesting about the consolidation uh, that we see now is people that are looking for outside um, kind of outsourced R and D. They see a company that's done a bit, and they're like, "Well, we could build that." Or we could just go buy that and then integrate it with what we do. I mean, you you see that uh, with like like Phenom people just bought My Ally, or Isims bought uh, Opening uh, .io. Like like those weren't distressed buys; those were R and D buys. Mm -hmm. And and so we'll see more of that. And I and I like that. I mean, again, I don't think you start a company to exit. I think you start a company to to solve a problem. And if someone comes along down the road and says, hey, we'd like to buy this because you've, you've, you've fixed this, for them, it's a make versus buy decision. They could either buy you or they could throw engineers at it and build it themselves. And that's just the cost of that time and money and energy of doing that. And, oh, by the way, you also have customers and revenue and, you know, all this other stuff, team. Um, and so I, I think that we'll see more. Uh, consolidation, but I, I'm I'm interested to see the bigger companies, the Infors, SAP, Oracle's, Workdays, mm -hmm. etc. I'm interested to see what they do and see how they consolidate and find things because right. you know at a, at a given point they need to they need to grow their market as well, and so some of that for them is buying you know large companies like. I think I think Ceridian or Kronos, excuse me, uh, Ultimate or Kronos, I think both of those were on not on the market, but I think that both of those were targets for those large companies, and for and for different reasons. All right. But because they put them together, you know, one point five, one point five billion, put those together, that's going to be a that's going to be a harder swallow for for one of these big companies so they've actually kind of protected it in a way that that merger has protected that them uh in a way so that oracle they can fend off an oracle or an sap a, a, a bit easier now again it doesn't mean that they won't be acquired but it would be at a at a premium we kind of touched on this earlier but the, the whole work from home explosion that we have seen over the past six, eight months, uh, I think has taken everyone by surprise, right? Uh, not just the fact that people are happier working from home. I think that would have been pretty much assumed, but that they're more productive. Um, and of course, companies are saving money, which is always gets their attention. Hey, we're saving money and, and our, our people are more productive and they're happier and uh, we've got less uh, you know, absenteeism and blah, 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 you know, and, um, and of course, you know, for, 
you know, c- certain people, especially people who are or maybe disabled, the ability to, to work from home is a huge advantage for them. Um, so what do you, what do you think about people going back to the office? Do you think you're going to well, see so, a mass migration back to offices? Well, okay. So remote work and what we've proven to ourselves. So COVID bad, 2020 horrible, but there are some things that we've learned about ourselves. Uh, and we'll take this one with remote work first. We've learned that we can do a bunch of these jobs from home or uh, remotely, and which means that what we used to be uh, was tethered to a location. So if you took a job, in, you know, in Topeka, well, then you know you'd move, you pack up the house, you move to Topeka, and you do the bit. Well, you don't have to do that anymore. You can still take that job in Topeka, but you'll just you'll just live there in you know in Connecticut, right? So we've proven to ourselves that we can do it remotely. Now, what that fundamentally has changed is everything in HR. Everything in HR and in recruiting was tethered to a location all the way on the front side with candidates. So if I were a candidate, I would search for a job. I would type in Dallas, comma, software engineer, comma, uh, full stack developer right? Because I was looking Mm -hmm. for jobs in Dallas. Well, now the same search is remote work, comma, software engineer, comma, full full stack developer, right? Our front end developer. And and so that now we've taken location out of the equation. And so every single thing that's in HR, the whole ballyhoo of HR has been predicated on uh, location, onboarding. Well, onboarding, well, you come into the office and then you go through this process. You go through some training. You got to sign some paperwork. Here's the bathroom. Avoid Nancy. You know, here's your cube. <laughs> here's your business cards. You know, like this yeah. this whole bit, right? Right. There's like a ceremony around this whole bit, but it's it was, it was predicated and institutionalized around you, you come to the place. <laughs> Gone. So everything is fundamentally changed. We don't realize because the ground is shifting underneath us, we don't realize how fundamentally recruiting in HR has changed. So let's just put a sticky note on that. Now, the businesses are learning, and I think in a really interesting way, they're learning about rent, right? They're learning about rent. Like we, we have 5,000, 10,000 you know, square feet in upper Manhattan, that, that costs an arm and a leg, you know, a right. seven-year lease. Yeah, they don't need that. So, so they're going to see a cost savings, which is which is remarkable for them. They'll take a, they'll they'll still have a thousand square feet of conference rooms and some executive things and stuff like that. But other than that, don't need the ten thousand. Don't need the twenty thousand. Most of those people can work from wherever they want to and learn. Now, what's great about that is it's also a tool for them to engage people. Like instead of engagement and culture being location based, now engagement is like, hey, how do you want to work? You want you want to work from home? You want to work from? You want to come into the office? You want to go? You want to do this? Hey, it's your choice. Like we're a company that basically says we have an office. If you want to come in, fantastic. If you don't and you want to work from home or maybe every Friday or every other Friday you want to come in, hey, that's cool. You work the way you want to work, which, again, is a fundamental change. Mm-hmm. Now, the question that you asked, which I, I think is a really, really super interesting one, is will we all rush back to the office? So two things uh, that, that, first of all, people, again, we deal with trauma in, in different ways and people deal with work in different ways. Um, remote work, um, there are people that thrive in remote work environments. You and I have been remote for a long time. And so we've learned kind of the bit of how to make it work for ourselves. And so some of this is personality, some of it's experience, some of it's personality. Introverts are thriving in remote work because they don't have to deal with the politics or the drama or the, you know, like what we used to call culture is that, you know, the water cooler, the break room, all that stuff, like throw that shit out. Cause introverts never like that stuff anyhow. 
So, <laughs> so, but we would call that culture. It's like, oh, our culture is our people are in the break room. Eh. Introverts hated that shit. They will continue to hate that shit. Extroverts on the other side of this are climbing the walls. You're right. They're literally climbing the walls because they want to be around people. They, there's an energy. They okay. want to get out of the house. They want to get out of the house. Okay. Yeah. Now, put that, to, to, so personality or work style, put those aside for a second. Um, I think people that, uh, that, are un, that have kids under, say, seven, Get Even me the if hell they're out of here, they want, <laughs> and, and they love their children. Oh yes. my God. They oh, love their children. I, I've but, got a buddy down in Austin who has five kids under the age of eight. Oh my God. Okay. Jesus. And he's, I mean, and, and I love him to death. And I'm like, what are you trying to do? You're building a baseball team. I'm like, well, what are you trying to do? I'm like, Stop. Get off of her. You're hurting her. <laughs> So, uh, so he can't wait for the office to open. I mean, like it can't open quick enough for him. I mean, he loves his kids. He loves his wife. He just, can I just get back to the office? And it's a respite at that point because right. I drop, I drop the kids off or the nanny comes over. I go to the place. I do the job. I come home and then I can kind of do the things I need to do. So for those people, again, no judgment, you know, if they need to get out of their house and get to the office, fantastic. I think it's ultimately a tell of who's a bad manager. So I'm interested in this uh, once COVID, you know, God bless, once COVID uh, it gets done is if a manager forces people to come back to work, to come yeah. back to the office. I think that's a tell right there in and of itself. That person's a bad manager. I agree. It, if it's if they if they force you now if they say, hey listen we want to have an in person meeting every other Friday, uh, and we're all in the same location it would be cool if we met somewhere and had barbecue and did a bit together yeah that's fine that's not that's not forcing that's kind of a that's okay but if you force somebody again that software engineer that's a front end developer if you force force that person to come to the office why. You got to ask the question. We've been, we've already proven to ourselves we can do the work. It's outcomes based. We can do the work. Why do we got to go to the box? Uh, why do we, why do we have to do that? So I, I think that will there be a rush? Yes. I think there will be a bunch of people that want to escape their houses mm -hmm. and for different reasons, but forcing people back to work, I think is a, I think is just dumb. But beyond just being dumb, I, I think it's 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 counter to the employee experience. We've already proven with some people this is just a better experience for them, for all the reasons you said. Okay, then let them work from home. Right. If that's what, if the outcomes if the outcomes get met, why do we care where they work? Back to the location thing for a second, because um, sure. it, it sort of triggered. I I listened to one of your use case podcasts with this mm -hmm. guy. Daniel Fellows from yep. a company called Optimal or Get Optimal, which right. does, um, which optimizes job ads, basically. Right. And, you know, he told you a couple of th things I found really interesting. One was the fact that, you know, in a job ad, it was always, you know, here's the job, here's the location, right? And then he told you that I think it was 87% of the searches on Indeed yep. included the term remote working yep that tells you something they're searching so and i, I talked to appcast yesterday they they do they've got a benchmark report you you would find fascinating because it's right up your alley and and they said that employers are responding in kind so now what employers are doing is they're putting remote work into their job descriptions so that they can be found so you have the candidate side that says, yeah, I want to work. I want to work in, you know, I want to, I want to work in Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. Or Austin, Texas. Hell, everybody wants to work in Austin, Texas. So yeah, I no want to work in, <laughs> I want to work in Austin, Texas. All right. Well, again, now those companies, again, wherever they are, if you want to live in Austin, Texas, and they want to they want to interact with your skill set they want the outcomes that, that you could provide 
then they need to put that in their job descriptions and their job ads. And they need to make sure that in their career pages, they need to optimize for all of that. I think one of the things that's going to be fascinating, Peter, is that dealing with compensation, which we haven't really talked about, but it is, it is something that is, is going to, it's going to hit us like a ton of bricks because we've been dealing with pay equity issues, you know, for, you know, let's, for lack of a better term for, for hundreds of years, but let's just, let's just deal with the immediate. Uh, we, we know that there's a pay equity gap. Mm-hmm. Now what's really interesting, like I said, how remote work and COVID has changed HR forever is everything in compensation has, has also been location based. That's right. By cost of living. So yeah. That same software engineer, again, software engineers, it's a $300,000 job. The outcomes decide what you pay for. You pay for the outcomes. Where they choose to live, that's on them. So if you choose to work in Austin, Texas versus uh, upper Manhattan or Tokyo or Sydney or something like that, it's still 300000 So I, I think in a weird way, we can actually eradicate pay equity issues by just putting a, putting a, a dollar amount next to the job. Mm-hmm. The, the job, the outcomes of the job are 300,000. And see how <laughs> we've done that historically is we've said that, we've set that base, comp set that base at 300,000. But if you live in San Francisco, it's a $480,000 job. Right. And if you lived in Midland, Texas, it's a $120,000 job. No, it's a three hundred thousand dollars job. Yeah, that, that's really you know you, you're bringing this up because when I talked to John Sumzer last week, he said if you are a software engineer in San Francisco and you decide to move to Montana, guess what? They're not going to pay you what they pay you in San Francisco if you're living in Montana. Incorrect. So here's here's why that's why I believe that's incorrect. I, I love John and and he's usually correct, but in this instance what they would be doing in doing that is creating more inequities. So we don't, we don't know. No company needs to create more inequities. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. <laughs> you know, that's a, they don't want to go down the path of creating more uh, lawsuits because right. you're going to, you're going to have no doubt. You're going to have people that are, that are, that are uh, all of the protected classes. And all of a sudden now you've got to justify well, you moved, you were making this and you moved to Montana and the cost of living. Hey, this isn't about the cost of living. This is about the job. It's about what I provide and you're paying me less than what I, what I, what other people that provide the exact same thing, which is the definition of inequity. So uh, again, your choice to live in LA or Hollywood, you know, that's your choice. You know, you're going to, you're going to make less because the cost of living in that place will take up more of the money. That's your choice. You don't have to make that choice. So I think that you can democratize that. And I think you can, will people learn that fast enough before they get sued is, is, will be rather, rather interesting because, you know, the first time you do that to a female engineer who made that decision, the very same decision that you talked about uh, is a lawsuit. That's a, that's a lawsuit right there just waiting to happen. Why are you paying me less? Yeah. Not just why are you paying me less than other men? Why are you paying me less than other engineers that are doing the exact same job? Right. And John's uh, wife will take that gig. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Heather will kill that. She'll crush it. But I, I, think, I, think, I think John's, I think it's common sense. I think it's right. I think people will try to do that up until the point where they start getting sued. And once companies kind of realize we're not in the business of creating more inequities. We're in the business of trying to level out and, and, and create a more equitable workforce. Now you take cost of living out of the job. You throw that aside and you say, what's the outcomes of the job? What does that, what is that? What, what do we, what, what is the market bear for that? Now, now you live wherever you want to live. Now that's your choice. You don't live in Midland, Texas. You make three hundred thousand dollars. You'll be a king. You know that that's that's a choice, right? right. You live in West Hollywood, three hundred thousand dollars. You're you're basically homeless. 
So, <laughs> but again, that's a choice. It's not my choice. That's yeah. your choice. You choose to live there. I yeah. choose to live there. So exactly. I, I think that that's, I think that's one of the interesting <laughs> things about remote work is in COVID is it's unlocked this. It's the job. It's with the outcomes of the job, which is what it should have always been about. You know, yeah. that, like how we got to inequities is because of, of all of these things. And, you know, paying women less, paying minorities less, paying, you know, veterans less, paying. Companies are going to get smart about this and just say, you know what? Here's the job. Now yeah. you can live. Now we know that you can work from anywhere and you can get the job done from anywhere. If you choose to live, literally, if you choose to live in downtown San Francisco, that's your choice. So this has been a hell of a year for talent acquisition and recruiters. And I keep hearing the fact that a lot of these people are getting laid off and they're not being able to get full-time employment anymore. They're all, you know, sort of going the route of the sorcerers, taking gig jobs, contract jobs. Is that what you're hearing? And do you think that's going to be around for a while? Yeah. I, well, I think, I think, first of all, I think most people under 30 don't use the same vernacular around work that we use. Um, and so I think they use words like gigs, not, not in a bad way. Mm -hmm. Like they look at the job that they have at Facebook as a gig and, and then Facebook offers them another gig, uh, and that's called internal mobility from an HR perspective, but it's just another gig. Right. I, I think recruiters, um, the ones that are out of work right now, take, take a gig, whatever the gig is, just take a gig and, and do something and then change that with another gig and, and just kind of keep going from gig to gig. Not necessarily thinking about like we, I think we've been frozen in, in time and thought of, this side hustle, Uber started kind of marketing this side hustle is this, that's the gig economy. And, and truth is, is work is a gig. You know, that's what work is. It's just a gig. And so you do a gig and you're at one point you do another gig. Now, historically, we've looked at that uh, as you, you know, especially back when you had loyalty on the company side and the employee side, I think that was associated with free agency in baseball, by the way. So once free agency happened, I think it destroyed really? the corporate loyalty. Huh. That's I think that, I think you can look at those in parallel. It's like at that point, free agents said, no, I'm going to go wherever the hell I want to go and make the most money possible. And Companies basically said, well, we don't have to be loyal to employees. And employees said they don't have to be loyal to, to companies. But even back then, it was just gigs. Like my dad worked at Warehouser. That was a gig. You know, like, like at points, you, and you, you just have gigs. You go from one gig to, to another. So I, I think that, you know, for my recruiting friends, you know, the, the thing is, is this is, a, this is a moment in time where you innovate at gunpoint. So if you have a job, you're doing more with less. And so you got to, you got to figure out how to innovate. If you're out of a work, then you've got to figure out how to innovate. And some of that might be just retooling yourself. You know, maybe, maybe this is a good time for you to go, I'm going to go learn, you know, these seven skills so that when things, not if, but when things come back, I've, I'm, I'm ahead of the game. Um, and, and, and again, I think it's a perfect time for that, uh, for folks. And if you, if you have to take a contract, which is kind of the route that you had talked about, take the contract, right? Like, so what? It's a gig, do the gig, you know, uh, what's funny about it, uh, contracts is people don't talk about the conversion rates of contracts, but a lot of employees come from contracts. So you know, I, I know that there's a health benefits part of this um, that I that I don't want to I don't want to downplay and, and ignore, but you know, if you're looking at taking a, a a gig with Lockheed Martin or a contract with Lockheed Martin that doesn't doesn't have benefits versus staying at home and not doing anything, take the gig, yeah, and work on your skill set. And, and then just keep your eyes open and keep applying to other jobs and, and, and other gigs. And uh, I, I think that anything you can do to keep yourself fresh as a, as a recruiter, a sorcerer, a hiring manager, uh, anywhere on that spectrum, 
the the ability to kind of re re up it's actually a drug term i shouldn't use that but the you you re you basically reinvest in your skills right mm -hmm. and so i think that's a choice that humans make about every three to four years where we're either going to learn that technology or we're, we choose not to and that is true of fax machines email you know everything every technology advancement that you know of it's either you say yeah i'm gonna learn that like some people do voice to text and there's a whole bunch of people that just skip that and say yeah i'm not gonna do that so I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just not gonna do that i'm just gonna wait for that wait to yeah we'll do the next one and that but that's that's also for talent acquisition professionals that's also their bit too they yeah. they choose when they want to innovate and when they want to kind of re up and learn some new things and when they're like yeah I'll, I'll wait for the next innovation and I'll do with that then so but I think COVID is a perfect time outside of the emotional stress I think it's a perfect time to say what version of me do I want on the other side of this and how do I get to that you know what can I what mm -hmm. can I learn who's doing it well like this is a good time to interview people that are doing stuff that's really 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 cool i think lars does this really well and Lori does this really well is they talk to people yeah and so they're constantly learning you do the same thing you're constantly learning new things and i, I think that keeps you fresh I, I i totally agree and i you know i've started calling someone every day who i haven't talked to in you know maybe Smart. a month or two months or a year or two years who i like yeah and just want to touch base with and it's it's really been um interesting and fun I, to do that i made an excel spreadsheet so this is how geeky i am um i made an excel spreadsheet of, of people like this and I, and I called it proof of life because <laughs> <laughs> of because so i'm just so dark but it's basically i same same bit it's i call in and then leave a voicemail or whatever and just basically say you don't have to call back i just it I, I really am just checking in on you. I don't need anything or want anything. I just want to see if you're okay right. and, uh, and, and, you know, talk and hear your voice. Um, I, I think that's, I think, I think COVID has helped us because in 19, you and I might not have done that bit. No, because we were on the airplanes too. Much and, <laughs> that's right? right. We had other chasing other, conferences. We had other priorities. So, so COVID's kind of dunked us in some empathy, in in a way that I I hope I'm I want to keep. Yeah. Actually, that spreadsheet. I want to add more people to the spreadsheet, and after COVID lifts, I want to keep doing that bit, and uh, because it's a it's a fun bit just to check in on somebody and say, Hey, how are you doing? Uh, it, you know, absolutely. Where, where you at? Yeah. So, what has inspired you over this whole shit show that we've been <sighs> dealing with for the past eight months? I'll tell you one of the things that's that is inspiring is um, in our little world, in the technology world that you and I follow and care about, is most of the vendors, if not all of them are quietly innovating behind the scenes. They're not telling anybody about it, right? Because their customers and their prospects, they can't handle, they're not selling, so they're not, there's that, but their customers can't handle anything new. So, but they're quietly behind the scenes, they're building all this new stuff that is really cool. And that's all over HCM, not just in recruiting, but all over HCM, they're building these, analytic tools and they're building predictive tools they're building all this real cool stuff that the moment that covid lifts and the kind of that that wave of new cool things come out they're going to be able to kind of open up their their jacket and show people a bunch of really cool things and because i do a lot of demos uh, i get to see those like every day i get to see like oh my god that's really cool can't show it to a customer right now <laughs> because, because they <laughs> If we did, they'd freak out. Like they, right. they'd go into they go into you know the fetal position. So can't show it to them, but they're quietly innovating. I mean, like all the ATSs that you and I know, every single one of them are innovating and doing really cool things behind the scenes. And the very moment that COVID lifts and they're out and they're really running and gunning, I think we're going to see this really. I think 
for you and I, it's going to be this amazing kind of wave of new cool stuff that, that they've been making these and quietly they've been making these investments since January and they just haven't been able to release them publicly uh, for all the mentions uh, for all the reasons I mentioned, but that's going to be fun for us to consume. Like you and I mm-hmm. are going to have just, it's going to be overwhelming on some level, but it's going to be cool because it's all these things that they've built and they've been building, you know, it's like these little, you know, it's like someone in a workshop, right? It's like, yeah. okay, the winter's coming and winter's there and they're in their workshop and they're building these really cool things. Spring comes at one point, spring comes, summer comes, and they get to show you all the cool things that they build in their workshop. I think that I've seen enough of that to know that that is going to be really cool for us. Uh-huh. Um, and it's inspiring. You know, you asked the, the question about what's inspiring. That's inspiring. The fact that when we get to the other side of this catastrophe, there's going to be a lot of really cool new technology that's released on people. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think a lot of it is going to have to do with uh, eliminating bias. And a lot of it is going to have to do with DNI. 100%. Right. 100%. I, and, 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 and thankfully so. I mean, that's actually, so the social unrest, I mean, first of all, w- going through just week after week of, uh, you know, people of color being killed, like right in front of us. Um, Unreal. Uh, yeah, it, it really is unreal. I think I think George Floyd is probably one of the more poignant uh, times because there is there's no like with a lot of these things, people will say, well, there's another perspective. You know, we didn't see what happened before. You know, we don't we don't know. You know, we don't understand. There was eight minutes where this guy had his knee on this person's neck, this human being's neck. Right. There's. There's no subtext. There's no. <laughs> there's nothing that explains that. That's no. just that's a murder that happened yeah. right in front of us. And that was so, black and white. And that Absolutely. was black and white. Was, that's all you could call it. I think so. You look at you look at social unrest and Black Lives Matter in particular, but just people being just pissed off at the system. I think one of the good things to come from that is the things that you just spoke of, is that people are looking at all the systems and recruiting hiring internal mobility you know all the things all the employee systems and they're saying well these are just as fucked up as other systems that we've been dealing with so let's fix them and so that i think i again if you look for a silver lining that comes from covid um that could be one uh and and a silver lining that comes from black lives matter and some of the social unrest is that we get on the other side of this and we have more products and more process and a better educated workforce where we reduce bias. Like we really mm-hmm. do not talk about it, right? but we really do it because we've taught you and I, well, fuck, we've been talking about it for 40 fucking years. So talking about <laughs> exactly. it, we, we, we're experts yeah. at talking about it, but I mean, actually the, you know, the intentionality, the actions, of doing something about reducing bias, I think we're going to, you and I, I think we're going to see that. I think we are too. So that, that's inspiring. I mean, again, it comes from kind of a place where you're like, ah, I'd rather George Floyd not have died. I I didn't know. I didn't know the guy, but I'd rather he not be murdered right in front of me. Okay. Um, However, (laughs) if anything can come that's positive from all of that negative, and we can get to another side, where we actually do see a reduction in bias, uh, then I don't know. I'm not going to say anything's worth it. I'm going to say that that's a silver lining, that, that something good is coming from something bad. Yeah. Well, William, I really appreciate your time today. Is there anything oh, sure. you, you would like to share with us uh, no. that we haven't discussed? No, I think, I think you know, it's, it's – uh, it's a choice. Like I, I, I went through a really tough time in 2015 and uh, I almost got a tattoo on my hand, like right, right at the, in between your thumb and your, your finger, your first finger, your gun finger, uh, trigger finger. Um, and I almost got this tattoo that basically said optimism is a choice. And I had it all drawn out in my mind. I was going to make it like, like one of those club stamps. Mm-hmm. You know, like it looks like you stayed out all night and it has like glitter in it, and, you know, one of those deals. But basically, optimism is a choice. And so I, 
because I went through a tough time, I wanted something that I could always look at that would, uh, you know, I'm right hand dominant. I could always see that whenever I get into a dark place, which happens frequently, whenever I get into a dark place, I could then get myself out of it by going, think positive thoughts, be an optimist. It's a choice. Yes, you can be a cynic. Yes, you can be a pessimist. Yes, you can think of the glass is, is, is half empty. Yes, you can do all of those things. But at the end of the day, you can choose also, you can choose the route or the path of optimism. Um, and even, even when you don't want to, even when it's in the face of all this shit like 2020 has given us, uh, it's still a choice. And so I think that if there's anything I would, I would tell people, they, especially folks that are going through tough times is, you know, first of all, there's better times on the other side of this. We know this, we, the human, human condition, we know that we'll survive this and we'll thrive on the other side of it. But just when you find yourself in a dark place, just try to be as optimistic as you can and try to ride it out and get to the other side. Awesome. Well, that's a good place to end. So again, thank you, my friend. And uh, I do look forward to seeing you in person at, I, at some point. At some point, you know, <laughs> and then not too See the one distant. or two. <laughs> yeah, one or two. You know, the vaccine We're... will be here, and hopefully it'll work. Yes, yeah, I, uh, sooner rather than later. Yeah, right. Sooner Absolutely. rather than later. Well, All brother, right. So, thank um, you so much. Thank you, and I will uh, obviously send you the link when this thing goes live. And, awesome. You know. And I'll, you know, if you want, I'll upload it to Dropbox or someplace. So, you, you know, you can put it wherever you want to put it. Well, and, I, I, I love what you do. I appreciate you, brother. Good. And, well, I appreciate you. And, uh, you know, I'm a pretty good video editor and podcast <laughs> editor. So if you ever need any any backup, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm just down the, just down the road from, I know. My, from the I guy know. who runs his I was company. about to say, Noel's right around the corner from yeah, you. Yeah, he's just yeah. up the road, yeah. That's too funny. Yeah. That is too funny. You and Kudik and Corsello and Noel all live eh, close close enough to right. each other where you could throw rocks. Yeah, so, exactly. That's some funny stuff. Yeah. Well, brother, uh, take care of yourself and you I'll too. see I'll see you hopefully I'll see you soon. Yes. All right. Thanks again, man.